Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today for this webcast on Epitaxi and ILD market to rise the more to more than a billion dollar, powered by your development and System Plus Consulting. My name is Faisal El Kamasi, and I'm a global sales support and coordination manager for your development. Before we start the webcast, let me give you some basic information on this online event. You have the possibility to submit questions during all the webcasts. You can use the ask a question window at the bottom of the screen. We will answer as many questions today as we can. And for the remaining one, we will follow up with you via email. Concerning the materials, please note that the presentation are already available and they can be downloaded from the resources section of the platform. Furthermore, you will receive tomorrow an email with the link to the recorded webcast session. So let's start the webcast. I'm pleased to welcome the three speakers of this webcast. Amin Alouche, Technology and Cost Analyst at System Plus Consulting. Vishnu Kumaresan, Technology and Market Analyst at YOL Development. And Tagui Yegoyan, Technology and Market Analyst at YOL Development. How three speakers will share with us their knowledge and expertise. I'm pleased to welcome as our first speaker, Amin Alouche from System Plus Consulting. Amin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Faisal. Uh, welcome again to everyone on this webcast. My name is Amin Alouche. I'm a technology and cost analyst at System Plus Consulting, and I'll present to you uh, an overview about technology and cost of silicon carbide and gallium nitride epitaxy for power devices. So System Plus Consulting is part of uh, your group of companies uh, with uh, collaborators uh, all over the world. Uh, we target different fields of expertise, including uh, power electronics, and more specifically, compound semiconductors, uh, such as gallium nitride and silicon carbide, which are the scope of this uh, presentation. Um, we offer different um, products from uh, yearly reports till custom services. So in this presentation, I'll first talk about silicon carbide epitaxy, uh, then uh, I'll follow by gallium nitride epitaxy for power devices. So a general introduction, uh, I will uh, talk about substrate and IP wafers. So substrates, uh, we deal with silicon carbide substrate, silicon substrate and sapphire substrate, uh, on which we will grow uh, different epitaxy layers. So for silicon carbide epitaxy, uh, it will be grown on silicon carbide substrate uh, to get the epi wafer, silicon carbide epi wafer. And for gallium nitride epitaxy, it can uh, be grown on both silicon and sapphire substrate as for uh, the actual GAN uh, power industry uh, until now. So let's start by silicon carbide uh, epitaxy for power devices. So as you all know, uh, silicon carbide devices uh, are one of the best candidates for high density systems that can operate at high temperature. Uh, they target different applications uh, such as uh, automotive applications in electric vehicle and so on. Um, despite all these merits of silicon carbide devices, uh, they still have some technical and commercial challenges uh, to face. Uh, and these challenges um, will be detailed in the next slide. So uh, here are some examples of technical challenges for silicon carbide. Uh, one of the most important challenges is linked to the raw substrate of the silicon carbide itself that remains one of the biggest cost drivers for the final uh, component cost, um, especially that silicon carbide uh, substrate is produced with um, a slower uh, technique like seeded sublimation compared to the Shokrowski process for silicon substrate, for example. A second um, challenge is linked to the silicon epitaxy itself that has specific requirements uh, for growth, uh, such as um, uh, high temperature uh, growth and uh, very high quality needed for uh, silicon carbide epitaxy. 
and uh, both of these aspects will impact the final yield of the component, uh, and more specifically, uh, in this case, uh, the uh, defects originating from the uh, epitaxy process. Uh, some uh, commercial challenges now we'll talk about. Uh, the first, they, they are linked to the supply chain, in fact. Um, for silicon carbide, different players are observed. Uh, so uh, we see some vertically integrated companies, such as Wallspeed and Ram Semiconductor, and uh, that can perform the epitaxy internally. And others, they may perform the epitaxy uh, in foundries. And as an, as an example here, XFAB uh, with uh, epi capability, uh, and in this case, dual AP layer is possible to be performed by XFAP. Uh, in at System Plus Consulting, uh, we have analyzed the majority of the uh, technologies uh, available in the market, and we could uh, classify them into two categories according to their gate design. So first is a planar gate uh, device, and the second category is trench gate devices. Uh, the majority of players uh, offer devices in a planar gate uh, technology, and few of them um, offer trench gate designs. Uh, we could observe um, different trends linked to the epitaxy layer, in fact, uh, depending on these uh, two categories. Uh, usually, uh, trench gate devices require thicker epitaxy layer to be grown comp compared to uh, planar gate devices. Other trends uh, linked to the epitaxy layer have been observed uh, concerning breakdown voltage now of the silicon carbide devices. Uh, here we are summarizing uh, different components we have analyzed for different voltages from 650 volt to 3.3 kV. And we could observe that a global trend is highlighted. So the, the higher is the breakdown voltage um, that needs to be held by the device and the thicker is the epitaxy layer that need to be grown. Of course, all uh, these aspects will impact uh, the final uh, cost of the silicon carbide wafer. And here, as an example of a total wafer cost breakdown, we clearly see the biggest impact is for the epitaxy wafer cost. So epi wafer cost, that means the silicon carbide substrate on which we have grown uh, the silicon carbide uh, epitaxy layer. So what about gallium nitride devices now? Uh, for gallium nitride devices, here we have uh, established a benchmark on the left graph uh, about the available GAN devices on the market. We clearly see two uh, categories according to uh, the voltage range of the devices. Um, the majority of players are competing for the medium voltage range, and this for the both uh, AP wafer types, as explained in the introductory slide for GAN on silicon and GAN on sapphire uh, epi wafers. Uh, these players uh, have different uh, supply chains. Some of them are integrated device manufacturers, such as InnoScience or Infineon, and others may propose a design in order to be fabricated in separate fabs. For gallium nitride uh, devices, different challenges uh, are uh, highlighted. Uh, here, more specifically, we talk about gallium silicon technology with a lattice mismatch uh, problem between gallium nitride and silicon. Um, also, uh, we have uh, the HAMT uh, technology, the HAMT device, which is normally on. And as you know, in power electronics, we generally prefer normally off devices. That's why different solutions have been proposed by the manufacturers, such as cascode or enhancement mode configurations, as well as different packaging and integration aspects. Um, these are some pictures of uh, devices we have analyzed in our reports with different epitaxy structures. So in the first and third image, we have um, gallium nitride epitaxy that have been grown on silicon substrate. Uh, some of them are with super lattice structure. And the second image is um, for GAN epitaxy uh, grown on sapphire substrate. Uh, so for sapphire substrate, 
we have less complex epitaxy structure than for silicon. This is uh, re because uh, sapphire uh, has a uh, less critical lattice mismatch uh, with GAN compared to silicon substrates. And generally for power GAN devices, we use MOCVD equipment for epitaxy manufacturing, and this will be detailed by uh, my colleague um, Vishnu in the next presentation. Again, some other uh, examples of uh, devices we have analyzed in our reports. And all of these, the epitaxy for GAN will be, of course, will have its uh, own uh, cost impact on the final uh, cost uh, of the wafer. Here, as an example, we show uh, a 650 volt GAN device uh, cost breakdown of its front end, um, where we can uh, clearly see uh, a big impact of epitaxy cost um, and yield losses cost uh, on the final uh, component and final wafer cost. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amin. Thank you very much for your presentation. Let's now welcome our next speaker from your development, Vishnu Kumaresan. Vishnu, please. Thanks, Faisal. Hello, everyone. I'm Vishnu Kumaresan from Semiconductor Manufacturing Team of your development. In the next 10, 15 minutes, I'll provide you a brief introduction to the Epitaxi equipment technology, market size projections until 2026, and a very brief look into the role of China in this space. I'd like to just mention that these are slides extracted from our recent report, Epitaxy Equipment for More Than More. To start with, what is Epitaxy and where does it come in semiconductor manufacturing process? Epitaxy is the process of depositing crystalline layers on top of substrates. These layers can be very thin or very thick. Layers can be as thick as two micrometers or can be as thin as two nanometer or even slightly less. In terms of substrate sizes, it can be grown on up to 12 inch or 300 millimeter substrates. On such a surface area and such thin layers, the complexity is to grow uniform, repeatable, defect-free layers that can be that can have good economics in terms of capex and opex. Growing a two nanometer layer on an eight inch or 12 inch substrate area is about a scaling factor of one is to 100 million. To put that scale associated complexity into perspective is equivalent to covering a football field with a uniform layer of bacteria or comparable to covering earth surface with a uniform layer of two basketball stack. So where does the epitaxy step come in the semiconductor manufacturing process? Epitaxy is one of the first steps in the front end steps. On a clean blank wafer called the epitaxy wafer, layers are grown using epitaxy equipment. On the epitaxial layers, other front-end processes such as litho, etching, implant, etc., are performed. Additionally, we can realize the importance and complexity of this process when we notice the sheer range of applications dependent on it. Just in more than more scope, these epitaxial layers are used in various applications such as MEMS, power, RF, LED, and lasers, as shown here. There are a whole range of materials as well that are grown on different substrate types. I'll not go into the details in this presentation, but as you know, depending on application, one substrate type or layer is preferred over other. We have studied this in detail in the main report. So how is the market size for such equipment projected to grow in the next few years? In terms of market estimation, we have countered the three major equipment types. First is MOCVD or metal organic chemical vapor deposition used for growing compound materials such as gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, and indium phosphide. Secondly, HTCVD, or the high temperature chemical vapor deposition used for silicon carbide and silicon deposition. And third equipment type called MBE, or molecular beam epitaxy, that deposits similar material systems as that of MOCVD. Together for these three equipment, the market stood at $692 million in 2020. 2021 has been one of the strong years with a jump of 15% in revenue for equipment sales. While we expect a slowdown around 2023 and 2024, the market is projected to grow gradually towards more than a billion dollar mark by 2026 with an overall CRGR of approximately 8%. 
Here I have provided the growth projection of the epitaxial equipment with respect to the different epitaxial substrates and epitaxial materials that can be grown. As you can see, gallium nitride is by far the largest for this equipment, and it is projected to stay this way at least until 2026. However, silicon carbide is projected to grow the fastest with a CAGR of approximately 10%, driven by the strong demand for power applications. In this slide, I have provided the growth projections split by the three major equipment types. MOCVD is the largest of all, with a market size of $420 million in 2020, and is projected to reach $630 million sales in 2026, with a cumulative sale of $3.5 billion in this time range. Most of the sale is projected to go to LED fabrication, and in terms of wafer diameter, it would be in 6-inch and below diameters. Secondly, HTCVD had a sales of $230 million in 2020, and is expected to grow to $393 million in 2026, with a cumulative sale of $2.3 billion in the time period. Though it is in the second position in terms of market size, it is projected to give the highest growth with a CAGR of 9.5%, thanks to the strong demand from power applications like silicon carbide and silicon. In terms of wafer diameters, it would be mainly for the 6-inch and 8-inch diameters for more than more applications. Finally, MBE had a market size of $45 million in 2020 and is expected to grow towards $68 million in 2026, accumulating a cumulative sale of $392 million in the time range. RF and laser devices would be the main drivers for the sale, with the wafer di diameters in the 6-inch and below range. So who are the equipment vendors providing such equipment? Here, we have identified 11 important players in the epitaxial space for more than one. On the left, I have provided the 2020 revenues and their market share for more than more epitaxy equipment. And on the right, you can see their market share change since 2018. The traditional top three players stay the same and their positioning remains the same. However, Vico has considerably lost the market share in the last two years and Extron has extended the lead in the top position. The difference could, could be due to their reach in China in the recent years. We will see a little bit later in the slides precisely about this. I'd like to show you through this slide that none of them, none of these 11 players have solutions in all the three different equipment types we spoke earlier. Extron being the leader has solutions in MOCVD and HTCVD. Biko in the second position has solutions in MOCVD and MBE. AMEC, the biggest player from China in terms of revenue, has solutions only in MOCVD space for now. Finally, let me show you a brief look into the influence of China in epitaxy equipment space. If we look at the overall semiconductor manufacturing equipment market, China has become one of the important spenders. Since 2012, it has increased the capex for equipment gradually and consistently, becoming the top spender in 2020. Though starting quite late compared to other regions, in terms of cumulative spending, China stands only third to Taiwan and Korea for the period 2012 to 2020. So how does China's spending impact individual equipment vendors' revenue? Here we can see the historic revenue split for top two players in the epitaxy equipment space, Exxon from Germany or Europe, and Vico from the US. It is to be noted that Vico's revenue here include other type of equipment and not, not just epitaxy equipment revenues. As you can see, Exxon has had 57% of the revenue in 2020 coming from China, and Vico only a mere 13%. The contrast could be due to the technological difference of the product offerings from these two companies. However, we cannot rule out the geopolitical tensions and their impact on the choice of vendors by the Chinese AB houses and foundries. To sum up, a growing number of upcoming applications in more than more space strongly rely on epitaxy, which will result in the epitaxy equipment market to grow at 8% CAGR between 2020 and 2026. The strong growth will lead to equipment sales of more than a billion dollar in 2026 and about $6.2 billion cumulative sale in the seven year time period. In terms of players, we have identified more than 11 established players in the market with Exxon from Germany, Vico from the US and AMEC from China leading the race. Finally, we have clear evidence that China is an important buyer for this type of tools 
and their choice of vendor could be influenced by geopolitical factors in, in addition to the technological edge of the vendors. We have looked in detail into each of these points and other topics in our report, Epitaxy Equipment 2021. Thank you for listening to me. Please feel free to reach me at this email ID or uh, for any related discussions after this webcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vishnu. Very interesting presentation. To finish this webcast, we will now listen to Tagwi Yegoyan from Your Development. Tagwi, please. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for attending this webcast. My name is Tagui, and my objective for this presentation is to give you an overview of ALD process and equipment used for production of more than more devices. For that, I will try to answer several questions. What is atomic layer deposition? What are the applications that use atomic layer deposition? What are types of ALD equipment? What is possible ALD equipment market development? And who is involved in ALD business as an uh, equipment vendor? Let's start with process and applications. ALD is a derivation of chemical vapor deposition technique in which gaseous precursors are, and reactants are used for deposition. A light CDD, ALD can be thermal or plasma enhanced. Now, unlike CDD, ALD precursor molecules do not decompose in a gas phase and hemisorb to the substrate surface. Rather, ALD precursor molecules react only at the substrate surface. During ALD process, the precursors and the reactants are injected into the chamber separately, divided from each other by a purge steps. Hence, in total, ALD cycle comprises four steps, precursor, purge, reactant, and purge. At each cycle, one monolayer of deposit is created, which is equivalent to one angstrom of deposit thickness. Such precise deposition enables excellent material properties, thickness control, and conformal coatings. However, of course, such precision has drawbacks, such as low growth rate, a high precursor consumption, and somewhat limited material portfolio. This is because ALD deposition requires tailored precursors that are stable in the bottle, vacuum lines, and chamber until they reach substrate surface. Despite the fact that it's quite difficult to create such precursors, most of microelectronic materials can be deposited already by ALD. The main ones are oxides and nitrides of aluminium, hafnium, titanium, tantalum, and silicon. Regarding now the applications, ALD is usually associated in public with more and more devices, such as logic and memory, since atomic layer deposition is used for the industrial production already for 20 years. Indeed, for logic and memory devices, ALD has been an enabler for their miniaturization, subsequent nodes change, and architecture, architecture transition from planar to 3D. We wanted to explore the ALD use for more than more devices, which is less known to public. Here, we consider more than more devices such as MEMS, power radio frequency devices, CMOS image sensors, photonics, and advanced packaging, mainly vapor level encapsulation. It is now a good time to explore the ALD use for more than more device manufacturing, since currently numerous ALD tools are being qualified for industrial production. Among identified more than more applications, ALD is used at various industrial level for device elements such as gate dielectrics, sidewall passivation, optical layers such as uh, anti-reflective coatings, seed layers and vapor level encapsulation, as well as for processing purposes for, for example, for patterning, edge or bonding. So what is the ALD equipment to satisfy the precise process conditions and applications? For that, we can use Benex transform system, which is visually comprehensible. ALD equipment is essentially a vacuum system quite similar to CBD equipment. There are two main subsystems. One is gas related and the other one vapor handling related. Gas related subsystem comprises gas deliver delivery to the reactor, reactor chamber and gas pump out, including exhaust, pump and eventually scrubber. Vapor handling system includes substrate entry point, transfer module, preheating module, and the reactor itself. 
The key differences between CVD and ALD vacuum systems are reactor architecture and ALD gas valves. The latter, ALD gas valves need to deliver robust millisecond action with a long lifetime. This millisecond action is most important since it ensures gas delivery pulses and effectively separates precursor and the reactant. We now focus on ALD reactor types. ALD reactor type can be divided according to the method of precursor and reactant separation, which can be temporal or spatial. Temporal ALD reactors can be 300 or 200 millimeter platforms used for more than more devices comprising various substrate materials. These reactors can be dedicated to single vapor or batch uh, operating thermal or plasma enhanced ALD process. Plasma generation here can be achieved by capacitive coupling, inductive coupling, or microwave. On the other hand, spatial ALD can be it can have also various configurations such as rotary systems, sheet to sheet, or roll to roll systems. Uh, with the latter two are not considered in the market sizing. Rotary reactor is usually a 300 millimeter platform that is used for production of memory and logic devices as well as CMOS image sensors. Rotary reactors can operate thermal or plasma enhanced ALD process where plasma is usually uh, achieved by a capacitive coupling. Considering all these types of reactors and their throughput, we can estimate worldwide ALD equipment sales for various types of more than more applications. Here, we do not consider memory, logic and analog applications. In 2020, we estimate ALD equipment sales uh, total, totaled 345 million, with the biggest contribution of CMOS image sensors due to the fact uh, that ALD is used in a number of layers and uh, the fact that uh, CMOS image sensors are produced in a high volume. This segment is followed by advanced packaging, mostly vapor level encapsulation, and power devices, mostly silicon 300 millimeter discrete devices. In five years, we expect that the ALD equipment market size will almost double, uh, reaching 680 million in 2026, and increase it with an average CIGR of 12%. CMOS, CMOS image sensors will still constitute the biggest market share. In terms of CIGR, uh, the highest growth is expected for photonics with 30% CIGR due to a production start of mini LED and micro LED, mostly for display applications. Next, power devices, advanced packaging, and RF are expected to grow with CIGR ranging from 12 to 15 percent, with the big contribution of compound materials, for example, for gallium nitride high electron mobility transistors. Uh, finally, we estimate that um, ALD equipment for MEMS and sensors will grow with a moderate CIGR of 4 percent. Finally, let's look at the companies providing the ALD equipment for more than more devices, which are highlighted. They can be divided by vapor size platform between less than and 200 millimeter platform and 300 millimeter platform. You can see that most of highlighted actors are at 200 millimeter platforms, but Benek, Picoson, and Vico, for example, developed recently 300 millimeter platforms as well. Among all these actors, we estimate that ASM is the market leader for 300 millimeter platforms dedicated to more than more devices, mostly for CMOS image sensors. And Picosan is the market leader for 200 millimeter devices, uh, various, acro various across all more than more applications. So to sum up, there are several takeaway points. Firstly, atomic layer deposition is able to deposit conformally a monolayer film at each ALD cycle. ALD industrial applications range from more than more to more and more devices. ALD equipment is a vacuum system with specialized ALD valves and various reactor architecture that is specific to applications, more and more or more than more. In the scope of more than more devices, we expect ALD equipment market size to 350 million in 2020, which should double in 2026. Featured ALD equipment providers for more than more applications are ASM, Atel, Nora, Picosan, Optoran, Benek, Vico, Oxford Plasma Institute Technology, and Plasma Term. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I wait for your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tagui. Very interesting presentation.
We are now going to wrap up with the Q&A session. We receive uh, some questions, a lot of questions. We will answer as many questions today as we can, and we will follow up via email for the remaining one. Let's start with the first question that will be for, for you, Amin. Um, why do we need SIP API layer? Okay. Um, so, uh, concerning silicon carbide API layer, uh, so unlike uh, silicon powered devices, um, silicon carbide uh, devices cannot be uh, directly fabricated on silicon carbide uh, single crystal. Uh, materials. Uh, that's why we need the uh, high quality epitaxial layer uh, that need to be grown um, on conductive single crystal in order uh, to follow up with the uh, remaining front end process on this uh, epitaxy layer. And of course, um, epitaxy layer uh, is uh, linked to uh, the blocking voltage as well. So the thickness uh, required um, to achieve some targeted blocking voltage for the uh, for the device. Thank you, thank you very much, Amin. Uh, Vishnu, uh, one question for you: uh, What are the main substrate types used for GAN growth? Uh, thanks, Faisal. So there are four four different substrate types. If I can uh, uh, say it in the bigger picture, it's uh, the first and foremost is sapphire. That's mainly used for LED both uh, traditional LEDs and micro LEDs. Um, second is silicon carbide substrates that are used for RF related applications. Um, third is GAN. It's not mm -hmm. very much in very high volume, but it's in terms of epitaxy complexity, it's much simpler to grow GAN on GAN. So GAN is a preferred substrate. And finally, uh, silicon. GAN on silicon is uh, entering high volumes, uh, mainly for power applications, but also for niche applications like micro LEDs. Okay, very clear. Thank you very much. Tagui, one question for you. Um, you did not show market size for memory or logic application. Why? So this is actually uh, uh, the most frequent question that we uh, got after we have published the report on ALD equipment for more than more devices, I precise. Um, I do agree that market size for ALD equipment dedicated to logic and to memory production is much, much bigger. But we wanted to explore ALD equipment technology and market. Uh, dedicated to more than more device production, since we see a growing potential in this field, and since the requirements for processing are different than from for more and more, and thus the equipment is uh, different than uh, ALD equipment for more and more. Okay, thank you, um, Amin. Uh, one question for you: uh, How can we compare costs of other substrates for GAN devices? Okay, uh, well, uh, for GAN devices, so let's first talk about GAN power devices. So for, um, as we have shown, uh, for uh, GAN on silicon, uh, generally silicon substrate has lower cost than uh, sapphire substrate. Uh, so this concerns for GAN power devices. Uh, also, we can have some advantage in the case of GAN uh, on sapphire uh, regarding the uh, epitaxy uh, cost. For other types, uh, for other applications, specifically for uh, radio frequency application, which we are not really covering in this uh, uh, in this webcast, we can use also silicon carbide substrate, but also um, in uh, R&D with some GAN uh, substrate, we still have a much more higher cost uh, compared to other types of substrates. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Amin. Thank you. Tagui, one question for you. Uh, what is the average selling price for ILD machines? Yeah, very interesting to know. Uh -huh. This is an excellent question for potential buyers of ILD equipment. Um, in fact, many aspects can influence the ILD tool price. Uh, to mention a few, it depends on vapor size and vapor capacity, if it's single vapor or if it's batch. A reactor architecture, thermal or plasma process. So plasma process will be more uh, more expensive since the plasma generation is needed. And finally, the application that is, if it's uh, if it requires, uh, if it is done for uh, R and D or for production. So just to give you an example, 
A uh, single wafer thermal ALD module can be priced at 1 million uh, at production, for production level, and batch ALD2 can be priced at several millions of dollars. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tagui. Um, we have uh, one question <coughs> for, for you, Vishnu. Uh, in the market forecast 2020 to 2026 for MOCVD, what could be the reason of having an increase for four inch or six inch wafer size and not above? Thanks, Rachel. Um, there are different dynamics in the industry, uh, what's going on actually. So uh, OEMs and IDMs for fabricating the devices, they like to go towards higher wafer diameter for devices to reduce the cost using the traditional uh, area cost uh, uh, economics. However, for certain uh, substrate manufacturers, it's simply not profitable to go to higher di diameter until there is an important volume demand. This is particularly the case for substrates such as sapphire, where the complexity increases for higher diameter and huge volumes are already in place for smaller diameters. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vishnu. Let's carry on again with you uh, with another question for you. For which type of equipment is there demand from China? Uh, MOCVD, HTCVD, or NBE? It's a, it's a very good question, actually, and it's a, it's a little bit complex to answer as well. Um, as of now, it looks like um, there's demand for all types of equipment in China. Like uh, We see uh, bulk orders and bulk commands from uh, different Chinese uh, foundries and uh, different players in the equipment space. They are confirming it as well. Uh, there are some demands for like 20 equipment at the same time without even trying prototypes. So I would say if I have to rank, I would say it's more for HTCVD, mainly for silicon carbide devices. But overall, we are seeing demand for all three types of equipment. Thank you very much, Vishnu. Uh, we have time maybe for a last question. Um, Tagui, for you, uh, how large is the atomic layer deposition market for logic and memory? So one can answer this question in a different way, uh, depending if, if the person relates to atomic layer deposition mark, uh, device market or equipment market. Uh, now, regarding the equipment market, I didn't uh, do the market sizing uh, for logic and memory devices, so I can't provide the exact numbers, but I can estimate that to several billions. So it is much, much larger than the one for modern more devices, uh, which was shown here in this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tagui. We received a lot of questions. Uh, the time is over now, so thank you very much for all the questions you are you are sending. We will uh, do uh, we will answer by uh, directly by email. Uh, the webcast is now over. Uh, you will soon receive email with the link to the recorded session. Also, please feel free to share the presentation with colleagues. Please let me remind you that you can find all our reports on our website www.i-micronews.com do not hesitate to contact us if you have additional questions uh, you can find our contact details on the last slide of the presentation thank you all for joining us today have a good time have a good day and take care <laughs>